Alaska is not just its landscape, it is most certainly its people. It's welcoming of wanderers and its creative heart. It's a place that you can only understand when you've been to. I feel incredibly lucky that such a difficult time could have led me somewhere so meaningful. Sometimes the best things happen when you are not where you were supposed to be. London is a very diverse place and that always attracted me. I moved there when I was late 20s. London just gave me more. I'm proud of working as a photographer in London, but I hadn't pushed myself to, to learn everything, you know? And that is the inner critic. I think that's the inner critic. Things like Instagram and Facebook present to you the very, very best of everybody else. And I suppose it's very hard sometimes to compare your work to them. I had linked being a grown-up to owning a property. I bought a two-bed flat apartment in Leash. So soon after the financial crash, being a landlord when I never expected to be one, became very, very, very stressful. I was photographing beautiful houses every day, yet my own property had become so toxic. It effectively brought me to zero. I do tend to, on my days off, spend the time with my camera on my own in London. Covid did give it that eerie, quiet feeling. I thought, what am I going to do with all this time? I read more, which was great, but photography was always still my draw out of the house. I had stored a number of boxes in, in a friend's garage in South London. They very kindly let me leave them there for five years. So over lockdown, it was the perfect time for me to get those boxes. So there was old photographs, notebooks. I suppose it, was, it wasn't an easy time. So it's helpful to look back and see that things are easier now um, to reflect on what I've learned. My father was in the fire service from his 20s. My dad's job to me at the time was something I felt very proud of. He was diagnosed with Parkinson's in his late 50s. And there is Godfather Paul. I came out to my sister first. She was upset, but I know why. She was upset because she was worried about me. My first night out, I know the date, it was the 14th of December 1996 and I remember that feeling of not, of, of, of hovering around the entrance close by to not be seen going in. I remember that, you know. It was a very different time to come out then. My siblings were very supportive and my mother the same. Personally speaking, I don't give a hoot about the use or a use about a hoot. I told my father while he was driving, so I thought, well, he can't crash the car. I know that it was a difficult and new idea for him, and I just needed to give him time. Oh, we'll have to wait and see. Okay, until next week, this is Dave Scannell signing out. He was thankfully very active for a long time after his diagnosis, but as it progresses, it will affect your memory and it affects your movement very badly. Um, your walk becomes a shuffle. He rang me just one day. It was just a very random phone call in the middle of the day and he just said, I love you and I'm very proud of you. And it was, you know, that was just him all over. In 2015, he, he died in April. Mm. 
my father was gone, there was no instinct towards healing in London. So I just thought, go. Some might see it as running away, um, and maybe they're right, but I think I was running towards something instead of running away from it. I have a real curiosity about Nordic places and cold, misty, rainy places, forests and colder weather. So Alaska was it. Landing in Anchorage is quite amazing. It's just so wide open and just the air is so crisp and clean and I needed that. And I wasn't, I was scared, but I, in a good way. Within the first few days, I had met a Scottish guy, a Canadian, a Russian girl, and then her two friends. So the plan was to make our way up to Healy, which is the last town to get to the magic bus. Christopher McCandless was a young American guy. He had a beautiful journey across America and he found his way to a rusty old bus in the middle of the Stampede Trail. I always sensed from him that he wanted to be able to prove to himself that he could survive. Now, I don't have any of those skills, so I wasn't planning on living on the bus. I suppose I, it was a pilgrimage for me to get there. What, what's always in the back of your mind is the idea of needing to be rescued. People have actually died getting to the bus. You can start out with the best intentions, but your feet are wet, it's freezing. It's 20 miles into the wild. Shea Paul. Here we have the living room. Um, this is the kitchen. It's really nice. We had, we had it put in last year. And uh, this is the roof that leaks water every five minutes. Thank you. We camped overnight. Um, the snow wasn't bad when we, when we built our tents. But when I unzipped my tent the next morning, I mean, the, it just a flood of snow came in. <laughs> Whenever I woke up last night, I just listened to the wind in the trees, and I've had a really nice two days here. Yeah, That's a lot. Should we wait until tomorrow to go back? It seems this is going to be really tough. Five hours in this. It's going to be okay because the trees is uh, allowing us to walk, you know, you yeah, know on the path. And I got my. Uh, my GPS too, will be okay. Oh God. Our boots had frozen solid. I mean, we were having, you know, sword fights with our frozen socks. I am the champion of the socks. After a few hours in that position, we knew we, we just can't go on any further. It just wasn't safe. So um, we had got about eight miles in. Um, and for them, I think that was enough of an achievement. At least we tried but we did pack up and leave. So after Alaska, uh, I had planned to do a Greyhound bus tour around America. I traveled all the way down through Nebraska and Kansas. I got down to Texas and Louisiana. From there, I traveled to uh, Australia were uh, six months to be a nanny for my sister's kids, which was a really important time. We, you know, we needed to reconnect. We'd just lost our dad, so to have that time with family was, was really helpful. I knew I had to go back home at some point. I could go back via Dubai, or I could go back via the States. And I think that's when I just decided it was time to give the bus another try. So I, I got in touch with the, with the Motley crew and they were all on for it. <laughs> Attempting the hike to get to the bus in May was uh, a much better idea. I'm just going to do some squats, get the body heat up, we're going in. We'd set out early and we were moving fast, so we got there in one day. 
the weather was a lot more hospitable. You walk around this wide corner, and all of a sudden the bus was just there. And just arriving there, it was surreal. And it was worth it. It was worth every second. Because it was like being in a movie. It was bigger than I thought. Quite a hulking, big old 1940s vehicle. It used to be used to ferry miners. Given that the tyres had gone flat, it actually gave it, gave it the impression that it was sinking into the earth. The bus is a shrine to how people feel about Christopher and how people feel about his journey. And that's everywhere. You can read it everywhere. There's also uh, a tribute left by his family. At first I didn't want to touch it. It felt like a museum piece. It felt about being respectful to the fact that a young man died there. He had tried to escape the bus, but the, the river had become too high. Um, he, was, he was definitely isolated. He was on his own. I had come at that point to not see it as where he died. I saw it as where he lived, because I believe he was very happy there. You know, it was a really, a really beautiful moment. And the people, I was with the perfect people because I think we all felt the same. It was just utter respect for the fact that this guy had made this journey here. I didn't think about leaving something, but it was very clear just at that moment when I saw the padlocks hanging off the central bar and the ceiling. I had been carrying my, one of my father's Dublin Fire Brigade buttons on my keyring um, for years. And I just thought, you know, I, I, I don't want to not have it, but wow, if it's there, it's there forever. I hadn't realized the connection the hike had to my dad being gone. So leaving the next day, it really felt like an achievement I'd got there. And to leave a piece of him there was just so wonderful. We all had about two weeks left in Alaska. We could either make our way to the Arctic Circle or somebody had suggested to us an old mining town called McCarthy. So we got there, we camped out by the glacier. My flight was leaving the next day and I just had the feeling I can't leave. I just don't want to leave. I told the guys what I was kind of thinking about. So one of my friends suggested flip a coin and whatever it says you have to do. So she handed me um, this Icelandic kroner and I flipped it promising to do what it told me. And it landed on stay. I didn't really know what to do. I was on my own all of a sudden. I was sitting in this tent. But it's when I woke up the next morning, I could hear people, I could hear birds, I could hear planes, little, little, the little Cessnas just flying by. And I was just so excited. I couldn't believe I was there. And I wasn't scared anymore. I knew it was the right decision. The first morning I woke up. McCarthy is effectively just a couple of dirt tracks. There's old abandoned cabins. I, s I felt a sense of the past. You're always aware of the mountains around you and it, you're, as you get further along the main street you can hear the water running, you can hear McCarthy Creek. I mean, at first, I think I was kind of the weird Irish guy who didn't leave. I was the guy on the outskirts of town in the tent who, I don't know, maybe they just, I don't know what, they might have been worried about whether I was going to make it, but people were just so kind. The Wrangell Mountain Centre attracts art, visiting artists, storytellers, all sorts of creative people, and they had um, accepted me as a, a volunteer gardener in return for two meals a day. So I, I had a, a constant source of people that I was meeting. 
McCarthy today, uh, at, the last, at the last census, it had 28 residents. They're, they're permanent residents. As the season progresses and more tourists come, obviously there's a mix of tourists, of quirky locals, um, of business owners. The population swells to perhaps three or four hundred in the, in the summer. And that gives you a really, really interesting and fun social life. So every Thursday there would be uh, open mic where visitors would get up and sing a song, do a dance. And that's when I started to kind of get to know people. There's a really, really good group of guys, very burly, sort of bearded blokes, who kind of took me under their wing in a very, very kind way. I got to help them for a couple of weeks in the forest building one of their cabins. Just one night in the bar, they just said, like, well, do you want to kind of watch us? And you can learn from us. I, maybe I put my camera down for a few weeks and I just learned how they build stuff and these cabins will be there for a long time. I mean, they're very well built. I'm the one who's actually building all of it. Um, I've always been quite butch, so I uh, just thought building was the most natural thing that I could have done. Um, so here I am. And I have a beard as well, so. It would always be my dream to build a cabin. So, the water dump, 70 litres of rainwater. So Zach is kind of precariously grabbing them and positioning them up there with little regard for his life, but he's actually very good at it. Yeah, everybody's home and happy. Yeah. Happy with their home. <laughs> this is my place. Finally coming together, man. There's a lot of years of hoping and praying. To have got to the point where I was so accepted by these guys, I really felt like so part of the community. Pat Garrett, she moved to McCarthy in her 60s. Um, she bought a rundown old cottage, an old historical cottage, and she restored the cabin. That's why I bought my house without even, I just looked in and there were five kinds of 1920s linoleum laid out in the patchwork a log cabin quilt design with horseshoe nails. And I said, I, have to, I want it. And uh, I got it. <laughs> and so did the carpenter ants. Yeah, they're vicious little boogers. My first season in McCarthy, she took me under her wing and we sit on her porch and we drink coffee and we, we gossip and we laugh. I love her dearly. I'm honored to be part of her porch gatherings. Little moments like that are the very essence of McCarthy. They just happen naturally. We don't plan them, we'll sit there, somebody might bring out some whiskey and somebody will get a guitar and we just sit and we play, we sing, we laugh. Good night, Irene. Good night, Irene. I see you in my dreams. Sometimes we live in the country. Sometimes we live It's a very unusual mix of people. You know, it attracts people from right across the political spectrum. It, you can find people who are very religious, people who are very liberal, certainly Democrats and Republicans. And, but what I love about that is how much, regardless of the difference of opinion, and they can be fundamental differences. How much this community cares for each other, it, it's very moving. Being so far from help, being so far from medical assistance, being so remote, you are forced to work these things through with people. Um, it's a very 
People are very accepting of each other and, ex and accepting of difference. That's what I felt. Mark Vail, he bought a piece of land when he was in his 20s, 12 miles from McCarthy. He grows enough food to sustain himself and sell to some of the businesses in town. He becomes so animated when he tells a, a story. He was snapping his jaws and he was drooling. So he saw you as food, not as a threat. He wasn't protecting himself. Uh, we don't know what his behavior was, and this is one of the last grizzly bears I've met, and it was the most unpredictable one I've ever met. He was able to tell me how to repel a bear attack. Noise measures, you got a gun, got fireworks, got anything, no. Pots and pans, bang, pots and pans together. Somebody like Mark, who's planning and gradual amassing of knowledge has afforded him a life in the wild, and it's inspiring to see. You can't be in McCarthy without wanting to explore it more, and as you get to know people more, people invite you on hikes, and that's how you make friends. So we, we would go off in groups, and sometimes the hike would be so far, it would actually involve a, a little plane ride a backcountry drop-off. Those were the days, golden and true. This is the place someday I'll return to. The days went by, the years rolled on. Together we stood, side by side we were one. It's, it's when you get up in the air, you see the sheer scale of the Wrangell St. Elias National Park. It's the largest in America. Endless landscape. And I think you can only really appreciate it from the air. It was the feeling of, what if I stand in a place that nobody has ever stood in before? Or at least not for a hundred years. That's, that's pretty exciting. Gone, baby, gone, take me home. Where I belong Those were the days Golden and true I don't know why, but these old cabins in the middle of nowhere that nobody wanted anymore Well, I wanted them and I got to hike to them and I got to capture them So it was a really weird form of therapy and it worked They have a phrase in McCarthy, they call it rust porn and it's just these sardine cans and plates just strewn across. The, uh, at the time it would have been rubbish, but now it's an open air museum. But they very proudly call it rust porn. Approaching some of the harder hikes, knowing that they're, it's quite rare that people make it to them. You know, uh, the Erie bunkhouse, which is perched 1,200 feet above the glacier, just on the edge of a cliff. It was abandoned in 1938. To push yourself to enter these buildings, because it can feel like a cough would push it over. When you get to a place like this, you're on your own. My purpose to see them was always photography. It was always to capture them. They will all be gone soon. So to see them in their current state, it's, quite, it's like a snapshot you know, upturned rusty nails, broken glass, and so many artifacts left from the men that worked there. The buildings themselves collapsing. It is like an open air museum. It's like actually the Marie Celeste. The sense that it's been abandoned so quickly that there'd be shoes, you know, plates on tables and sheets on the bed still from 1938. That's epic. The jumbo bunkhouse has collapsed on one end so that this, 
it was up on stilts, as I imagine it. So the whole thing has just effectively done that. So some of the rooms, it it's completely warped. Your your internal spirit level is warped. You can't tell what is level anymore. So it feels like you're fighting your way through a sinking ship to get to the tops of these buildings. The 4th of July is a big celebration in town. It would attract people from all over. Neil, who runs the saloon in town, is a very prominent character in the organising of 4th of July. You know, this, this kind of kicks off the peaks of the summer, you know, because it's pretty dead for the first four or five weeks of our 120 day season, you know, so we, it, it's a small season to begin with, but it really doesn't get busy for a while, and it usually takes 4th of July before everyone stops lamenting about, oh no, oh no, it's not going to be busy this year, oh no, oh no, and then 4th of July happens, and it just stays busy until about Labor Day. One, two, three, eat the pie. This is a small town thing. The, it's kind of an important day in the sense that it establishes that we're a community, you know, and, and it's clear that it's a community and that, that matters. There had never been an LGBT float um, in the 4th of July parade. I felt it could be the time and I felt that maybe I kind of was involved in the community enough to perhaps suggest it at least. So with a local um, quilt maker, uh, Maria Shell, I made a banner for, the, uh, for an LGBT float. We called it Out in the Wild, which I thought was a good play on words. Look at this thing. <laughs> it's too cool. I felt that the identity aspect of it didn't matter. It was because they were happy to support me and I was very honored by that. That year we led the parade, like we'd 16, 17 people join us. I often had a costume change, so I might have a nice sequin number and then maybe shift it into American tights, but I always looked fab. Walking in the parade, or sometimes on the hood of a car, waving a big pride flag. It's, it was amazing. I mean, you know, it's a small town and uh, there are a lot of different views and opinions, but the, the warmth and the acceptance was there. There were cheers and it was, it was a really, really good moment. The 4th of July is a celebration of America. So it isn't a pride parade. And I think that's a really nice thing for the banner to be accepted in that celebration of Americanness. The banner has become part of the town's history. And if I know that the banner comes out again and in a 4th of July parade, or maybe even, on, maybe even its own pride parade, I'd be very, very proud of that. After I left McCarthy, I gave Dublin a try um, for a year and circumstance led me to have an opportunity to exhibit my photos in the Paris Court Town Centre. And from that, I suppose I got the confidence to consider myself a photographer. I had the idea after the exhibition to apply for an artist's residency in Northwest Iceland in the winter. Having chosen McCarthy over the Arctic Circle before, I thought, mm, it's time for the Arctic Circle. And after 
I was approached by an American publisher to produce a book of abandoned buildings. I saw the book as an opportunity to bring together all of the work I had produced in Alaska and none of that would have happened without the support that I had got from the people and how random my journey was. In June of 2020, the Alaska National Guard moved Bus 142. They had airlifted it because of safety concerns. It was, it was a big deal to see that. So the bus will form a museum piece in Fairbanks, Alaska. I'm just so curious to know whether my dad's fire brigade button will be part of the exhibit because I think that would be an ending that I could have never planned. This could work. I think we want something with this. <laughs> Letting myself go with the wind brought me to healing and it taught me to trust the world again. I feel if I go back, there'll always be a smile at the bar. It's my dream to have a piece of land there someday. And maybe what I learned about cabin building, I could put into action. I'd probably need to brush up on my skills, but I will visit McCarthy forever. <laughs>